I woke up one Monday morning, 2010. I looked around and I realized that I had everything except the one thing that I actually wanted. I was a business owner, which is something I'd always wanted to be. I was an entrepreneur. I was married to the person that I wanted to be married to, my best friend. We were starting to, to plan a family. We had you know, bought a house. We were living in a house that I thought it would take me perhaps decades to afford. And you would think, objectively, you would think that we would be pretty happy. I would be pretty happy. But of all the things that I had, I was missing one thing. I was missing peace. I didn't have, any, I felt like I was living in chaos. You know, I had all these things that I said that I wanted, but for some reason, I was unsatisfied. I wasn't happy. I felt like life was kind of passing me by. And even though I had people in my life that I wanted in my life, and I had chosen, I had, I had created this life, for some reason I was unhappy with it. And I came across this quote by Seth Godin that, that really, really jumped out at me. And here's, here's what it said. The quote said, instead of wondering when your next vacation is, maybe you should set up a life that you don't need to escape from. Now, most of us are used to going on vacation, but if you've been on the same kinds of vacations that I've been on, you know that when you're on vacation, even if you get a break, you come back and you feel like you need a vacation from that next day at work, right? 7,000 new emails, you've got all this stuff that's happened, there's something that's at home that's broken, you've got to fix it. So like, even vacations didn't feel fulfilling. And I came across this Hebrew word that seemed a little closer to what I actually wanted other than peace. Because right, when we think about peace, what we really think about is the absence of conflict. Right? We just like, when things are peaceful, there's no conflict. But I had, I didn't have a lot of conflict, but I still didn't feel like I had peace. And there's this, there's this Hebrew word, shalom. The interesting thing about this word is that it's more than just peace. It means something that's complex, that has a lot of moving parts, that's in a state of completeness or wholeness. Now, can we agree? Can we agree that our lives are more complex than they've perhaps ever been? Can we agree that we've got a lot of, we've got a lot of moving parts? But how do you take all of those moving parts, how do you take all of that complexity and make it whole? And that's the question that I started to try to figure out, started to try to answer from the time I woke up that Monday morning in chaos. Now, one thing, let's, let's get something clear, because I know it's summertime, I know we're, we're having like time where we're, we're maybe at work, or we're dealing with some stress, and we're scrolling through like our Facebook, our Instagram, our Twitter, and we're seeing our friends on vacation, Right? They say they're going on vacation, it looks really nice, and we're stuck maybe at home or at work, and, and it's like it'd be really great to be there and not here. Let's, get, let's make a distinction really quick between a vacation and a trip, because a lot of times when we say we're going on vacation, we're kind of lying, and we're not going on vacation at all. Where we're really going is on a trip. So here's a, here's a way to make a distinction. As you're scrolling through your social media, if you see children in the picture, <laughs> it's a trip. No, trips are good. Trips are good. Well, you can, yeah, I know, I know. Some of you have been on a trip, right? If you see extended family in the picture, <laughs> it's probably not a vacation. It's probably a trip. So let's, let's make a clean distinction there. But when we think about all this complex stuff, right, because, because those are all things that are incredibly important to us. Family is important. Our children are important. The people that we do life with are important. And so is shalom. So the question is, is how do we create shalom? How do we create wholeness, completeness, and keep the things that are most valuable or that we claim are the most important? It reminds me of something we say in, in our coaching practice um, at Dale Carnegie all the time. Something Mr. Carnegie uh, said over and over in his writings. He said that all people possess innate 
greatness. All people possess innate greatness. And that's where we're going to start here is where we're going to start our premise for the day and how we create a life that we don't actually need a vacation from. Because this is counter to the way a lot of us think about ourselves and the people around us, right? We're, t- we're a lot of times, and, and some of you grew up in church, some of you didn't. I grew up in church, and a lot of times church folks, they start their theology in Genesis chapter 3. They start the way they see themselves, the way they think about themselves, and everyone else around them in Genesis 3. And in Genesis 3 is the fall of man, original sin, right, where, where Eve tricked Adam, No, that's not how it went. Where where Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, right? And that's where we start. But here's the thing. And here's here's the, the foundation of this message today is that the Bible doesn't start at Genesis 3. And it doesn't end at Malachi. And so we're gonna start with this idea that all people possess innate greatness. And even in a, even in a non-church, even in a non-Christian world, like the world I live in, I'm, I'm not a pastor, I'm a coach. And one thing that I get the privilege of seeing is people stepping into their innate greatness. And one of the things we say, one of the things I tell people a lot when I'm coaching them is, I'm not here to give you something you don't have. I'm not here to put something inside of you that that you don't already possess. There's nothing I have that you need. Everything you need is already inside of you, and my responsibility isn't to give you stuff. My responsibility is to help to create space so that I can can create environments so that we can pull those things out of you. And over and over, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, I've seen this real-life, real-world example of people stepping into who they actually are, and when they do that, they get to see, I get to see, and the world gets to see innate greatness. And it's caused me to, to really have this fundamental belief. Not only were we created by God, but we are also created of God. There is something in us that is innately great, that that needs space to come out of us way more than we need some some dude on the stage to give us knowledge, to give us wisdom, to give us understanding. And so with that in mind, let's let's start. Let's start in Genesis 1. So in Genesis 1, we see God show up as creator in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1-1, the very beginning, we see God's first, before we know anything about who God is, we see that he is creator. And I don't know that many people are going to argue the fact that if, if God created everything, if we're going to work on the premise that God created, then if you could just look around, right, and you know that God is creative. Like, have you ever held a newborn child in your arms, there's no doubt when you look at that child that God is creative. If you've ever sat on the beach and watched the sunset, there's no question that God is creative. If you've ever been to Walmart after midnight, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a different, that's a different sermon. Okay, okay. So here's, here's, here's what jumps out at me, though. Here's what jumps out at me. Not only does God's first characteristic show up as being creative and creator, so does humanities. So does humanities. So when God shows up as creator in Genesis 1, we see after God creates everything, he creates man. And then here's what, here's what the Bible says. Genesis 2.19, now the Lord God had formed, formed out of the ground all of the wild animals, all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. Can you imagine, like, what that was like? Like, Adam is, like, brand new. Like, he's brand new, and God brings him, like, all the animals, and he's like, all right, first job, name these. He's like, I don't know, platypus, like, octopus, like, dog, like, snake, and God's like, I didn't, I didn't make, (laughs) I don't know that I made those last two, but um, that's maybe a different thing, too. But Adam's first job, so maybe God's showing us something, Right? Maybe God's trying to tell us something about who we are when he goes, hey, the first thing you should know about me is I am creator, I am creative. And oh, by the way, the first thing maybe you should know about you is that you're blessed and that you are creative. Because maybe Adam needed to prove it to himself. 
And that's one of the things that I find for us, if we want to create something, if we want to step into what we can really be, the first thing that we have to do is we have to, what we say in our business is earn the right. We have to prove it to ourselves before we can prove it to anyone else. Before we want the world to see us a certain way, we have to see ourselves a certain way. Now, as you know, and this is something that's thrown around all the time, we also say that we're made in God's image. We're made in God's image. And people can like, you might, you might like gloss over that a little bit. The Bible says that so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Now, if that's not enough evidence that God is creative and, and man's first job was a creative act, something to do that, to solve something, to be creative, and then God even said, oh, and by the way, not only am I creative, not only are you creative, but you're also made in my image, you might still be sitting here thinking like, well, that's good, but maybe I'm, I'm, the, I'm the outlier. I'm not creative. I think I can prove to you that you're creative. I think it's so self-evident that I can prove it to you even now. So, so here, here, answer this. If you've ever had any anxiety in your life, any, of any kind, if you've ever had any fear, if you've ever worried, that in itself is a testament to the fact that you have innate creativity inside of you. Here's how. It reminds me of a time back a few years ago, 2011, I had a flight to catch. It was an early flight, and this was a big meeting that I had to get to. It was on the other side of the country. So I get up early. We lived in southeast Raleigh at the time. I had to get to, uh, I had to, get to RDU, and so I drive down Highway 401. I exit onto Highway 40, and I start on the exit ramp. And when I get to the exit ramp, I realize that traffic is not what I thought it would be. You know, it's early, there's not going to be any traffic. This was, what I saw was a sea of headlight, uh, taillights, completely stopped. So my first thought was this, natural. Oh no, I might miss my flight. But that's not where I stopped. That's, that's just seeing it for what it is. Then I got creative, and I said, oh my gosh, if I miss my flight, I'm going to miss this meeting. If I miss this meeting, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna get this piece of business. If I don't get this piece of business, I can lose my job. If I lose my job, I'm, I'm gonna lose my house. If I lose my house, my wife's gonna leave me. If my wife leaves me, I'm never gonna see my daughter again. If I never see my daughter again, I'm gonna lose my health. What's the point of even living, right? That's in like an eighth of a second. Have you ever had that where your mind just like runs away? What is that? What is that? What is that if not creativity? What is that? So the question is, is what do we want to use our creativity for? Because we know the difference between people who are willing to use their creativity to create a life of shalom, of peace, of completeness, of wholeness, and we also know people that don't. I'll give you an example. Think about someone in your mind, think about someone that you either know or have known in your life at some point, that when they enter the room, it just gets brighter. It's better. The air is lighter. Things are better. It's fun. When they show up, it's, it's going to be a good day. When you think of that person, just raise your hand so I know that everyone has one of those people. When you think of that person, raise your hand. Okay, good. So it's pretty easy to think of that person that brightens the room. Okay, second question. Second question. Think about a person that you know or have known that when they enter the room, it brightens when they leave it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's the difference between person A and person B? It's not that there are different species of humanity. Well, some, <laughs> sometimes I can be debated, right? It's not that there are different species of humanity. Oftentimes, it's the difference between their choice and how they use their innate creativity, how they use their innate greatness, because we can use our innate creativity, our innate greatness, to create something that, as Genesis would say, as God would say in Genesis 1, that's good, or we can choose to use it to further break down and participate in a pattern that further breaks down this word shalom. Here's another example of this type 
of people. I say that this is one of the things we teach in our, in our programs, is you can be one of two types of people. You can either be a thermostat or you can be a thermometer when it comes to your circumstances. So here's the difference. When you think about the purpose, what's the, what's the, what is the purpose of a thermostat? Purpose of thermostat is to control the temperature, right? The purpose of a thermometer is simply to what? Is to tell the temperature. It just tells you what the temperature is. So every once in a while, and look, I'm not immune to this. Every once in a while, I decide to not be the thermostat. I decide to be the thermometer. So I may walk into a situation, and it's maybe a little hot, and people are a little upset. It may be in my kitchen. <laughs> And so what do I do? If I'm operating as a thermometer, I just, I just rise to that temperature and I start participating in whatever pattern, whether, whether I'm with someone I care about or not, I start participating in a pattern that's counter to what I'm actually after, right? I'll, I'll bark back or I'll start arguing or, or I'll, I'll, I'll shut down or I have a bad attitude. Or, or a situation might come up where I walk into a to a circumstance, and it's cold. I'm getting, maybe getting the cold shoulder, and it's like, okay, if you ain't gonna talk to me, I ain't gonna talk to you neither. And you, <laughs> don't point, don't point, that's not nice, that's not nice. <laughs> okay. Or, I could choose, because it's an active choice, to operate in a different way, to show up differently. Instead of being a thermometer, I can show up and be a thermostat. So when I show up and decide to be a thermostat, that means when I encounter a situation that's hot, I start immediately working to bring that situation down to a more comfortable temperature. When I enter into a circumstance that's cold, I start working to, because my job is to create and, and restore shalom everywhere around me. And when we start becoming victims to our circumstances, then we're, just, then we're just raising our hand and saying, I quit. I give up. I'm just, I'll, just, I'll just go with the flow. This is, these are the cards that I was dealt. But that, I don't think that's the way that we were created to actually be. Here's what Mark Twain said about it. I love Mark Twain. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been here? You've known a great many troubles, but most of them never actually happened. <laughs> have, you, have, you ever, have you ever lived in, in that reality? But let's, let's take a look and see what God actually does, right? Because here's, here's, what, uh, here's what I grew up doing. And, I, and uh, honest to goodness, for, until probably the last six months to a year, this creation story to me was simply an account of creation. Just, just quite literally, it is only there to tell us kind of how everything happened, right? That's really it. One of the things I found is the more literally I, I read every single thing in the Bible, like, like even something like this, I, I miss stuff. I miss stuff because what I find is that God isn't just telling us stuff. He's also showing us stuff because here's what happens. In that second verse of Genesis, Genesis 1 verse 2, it says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And I, and I thought to myself, like, how do you have a formless earth? Like, what does that, what does that actually mean? And so I went back and I looked at the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is this word, tohu. Tohu, which is a fun word to say. And it means confusion or place of chaos. And then I kind of thought, like, okay, so God just, God created everything, but he created chaos? He created emptiness and nothingness? He created a place of chaos? Like, what is that? So an all-powerful, all-knowing, om omniscient God creates something that's completely chaotic? Like, to me, that doesn't really line up. But once you, once you read, like, what he actually does, that perhaps there's a structure in here for us that we can follow when we find ourselves in times of chaos, which is what I started doing back in 2010 when I realized that I had everything I wanted, that I had created this thing that still felt chaotic. It had a lot of good pieces, but it did not fit together. In fact, it reminds me of, you know, when, when we just tell people stuff, or we just like, when God just tells us stuff and doesn't show us stuff, it leaves us open to really make some mistakes, to do it wrong. Uh, the best example of that I have is, 
uh, about a year ago, we were living in an apartment, and in this apartment, uh, we, we didn't have a lot of space. We, we had a house being built out in New Hill, and uh, my wife took it on upon herself to teach our five-year-old daughter something new. Give her some new responsibilities. She's five after all, so it's time for her to start helping around the house a little more. So the first plan of action was let's have her start taking her dishes and putting them in the dishwasher. And so we're sitting there at the table, and we figure she knows how to put dishes in the dishwasher. And so I say, baby, uh, go ahead and take your dishes to the dishwasher if you're done eating. So she picks her plate up and she goes and it's fine. Well, a few minutes later, Meredith takes her dishes to go, put them in the dishwasher, and here's what she finds. <laughs> so even when my daughter was trying to be compliant, we ended up with a dish on top <laughs> of the dishwasher. So what we found was that if we don't show her and tell her if we just tell her, how many of you, maybe you grew up in a, in a house where you had a parent that says, do as I say, not as I do. Yeah, <laughs> there's a few, few head nods. What actually happens? Do you do as they say, not as they do? Or do you do exactly what they do? Five times worse, <laughs> right? And so, so let's actually look at what God is showing us. So what does God do? So, so God creates everything, then he's got chaos. Now what in the world does God do with chaos? Well, the first thing, and this is, this is your, first, your first note here, is he sees. He gives himself an opportunity to actually see. He cuts the lights on. Genesis 1-3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. God turns on the light to illuminate the chaos, to illuminate the chaos. So here's, here's the thing. When we think about the chaos in our lives, oftentimes the reason we can't fix that, we can't figure it out, isn't because we don't have the answer, we don't know how, we couldn't figure it out. It's oftentimes that we don't get slow enough to stop, bring some awareness to it, turn on the lights and say, okay, is this the life I want to be in? Is this how I want things to actually be? We don't ask ourselves that question. Right? And, and so we start, we start shooting at stuff that's, that, that, that doesn't actually get us what we want. Right? We shoot for a, a bigger house, or, or we need something new, or, or, we just, or we'll, just, we'll, just, you know, we'll just scroll our phones and find happiness there. We'll, we'll do something else to try to, to, try to like distract ourselves from the fact that there's a, like this, this, this deep, like this, this secret unhappiness, the secret like non-peaceful, this like lack of shalom in our lives. And when we start shooting for things that we don't actually know what we're shooting for, you have no idea what mark you're going to hit. In fact, I told you about the apartment. When we were living at that particular apartment, um, I would oftentimes take runs. And, and the way the, the run would go is it was, there was this long road, and it was the same road that we traveled on to pick, drop off and pick, off, pick up our daughter from preschool. And so uh, a long run for me, a really, really long run for me is about five miles. Like that's, to me, that's a marathon. Like for, in fact, I, I want to get one of those bumper stickers. You know how you have like the marathon bumper stickers? The one that I want to, I want is the one that says 0.0, I don't run. That's like, that's my favorite bumper sticker. Um, but as, as I'm running one day, I plan to run down for two and a half miles, turn around and come back. And it was a midday run. I was working from home for the day. And for whatever reason, I was just tired. Like I wasn't feeling it. So I'm run, as I'm running, I get to that two and a half point. And when I turn around, I realize that it's about time for my wife to pick my daughter up from preschool. So I know she's going to be coming soon. So I'm struggling. My lungs are burning. My legs are hurting. My back is sore. And I'm kind of like just barely limping along. I'm only running to get it done faster. And it's really slow. But I know that when my wife comes by, I can't be looking that way, right? So I keep, my gaze is stuck kind of at the horizon to, so when I see her car coming, you, you know what I'm gonna do, right? I'm gonna perk up, I'm gonna put my shoulders back, and for about 18 seconds, I'm gonna look really strong and really athletic. That's the plan, right? Okay, so, so here I'm running, I'm hurting, I see the car, I see her car, here she comes. And I'm like, yes, this is my chance. So up I go, shoulders back. I start running like an athlete. I'm looking good. And then I realize I've got an opportunity. 
I've got an opportunity here. Because as she comes by, this is one of those rare times where I can really demonstrate my real, like, af- my love and affection for her, right? So, and prove to her that I don't care, like, who knows, and that, that she, she needs to know that I'm willing to kind of make a fool out of myself if I need to. So as she comes by, I, I stop the, the athletic run and go into, like, a sidestep. And so I'm sidestepping, and I start blowing kisses, <laughs> right? Just blowing kisses and blowing kisses. And as she drives by, I realize that it's not my wife. <laughs> it's a rather old man, burly, big white beard, right? And so I, so, so I had about a mile and a half left. I ran that mile and a half probably faster than I've ever run any mile and a half, uh, lest the man you turn and come ask me exactly why I was blowing kisses at him. But this, that's an example. That's an example of what happens when we're, when we're trying to hit a mark and we don't know what the end really is. I wonder if you've ever had that in your life, right? Like, when I get this promotion, or when I get into this house, or if I ever get this car, or if I ever have, like, the, ne- like the next thing, or if I, if I could just get to this, I would feel I would be happier. And you are for a few days, or a few weeks, or a few months. And then the next thing needs to come along. But what if we weren't created for that? In fact, here's, here's one of the ways I think about it. I think about, we could all kind of think of our lives, if we, if we have the pr- proper perspective, we could think of our lives kind of like a unicorn, right? Like, a unicorn is one of a kind. It's unique. It's majestic. It's special, right? If you see a unicorn, when people talk about, man, that's a unicorn, that means it's something once in a lifetime, once in, once in a generation, once in a decade, once in eternity. It just doesn't happen what if you started thinking about yourself like that? Because, frankly, most people don't. Like, it's, like there, I can give you example after example after example of people that I've had the privilege to coach that don't see themselves as anything special. But what happens when they start seeing themselves differently, the world starts seeing them differently. And when the world starts seeing them differently, they start to get some of the places that they want to be. They start to step into who they really are. So you've got two options this morning, really, as far as I'm concerned. You can see yourself, you can see your life, you can look at the possibilities of the rest of your life like a unicorn, or you can just see it as an average donkey in a party hat. <laughs> That's really your choice, right? But I will tell you that you're, that you're not a donkey in a party hat, right? There is something unique there. There's something unique there. So once, you, once you've turned the lights on, once you, once you have full awareness of, of what's around you and you say, okay, here is my chaos. Here is, this is mine. This is what I created. Now it's time to do something about it. God gives us the first step. Now, it's interesting to me that God doesn't just start creating stuff. Right? Because that's, that's what we do a lot of times. Right? We go, we go, man, I'm feeling a little empty. I'm not feeling complete. So I need to like... I need, to, I, need to, I need to start doing some stuff, right? So we add, like, well, I just need to start maybe, let's get a gym membership, or, like, let's join this thing, or let's do this. And we, so we, just, we, did, we don't make ourselves happier. We don't make ourselves more content. There's not more shalom. There's just more distraction, so we don't think about it as often. So God doesn't just start throwing stuff at it and saying, here, let's take this chaos, and let's just start creating stuff. He doesn't do that. You know what he does? God actually starts taking stuff out. God didn't start by creating stuff. He started by separating. So when you look at the first three days of creation, God turns on the lights, God says the lights are good, and then he immediately starts to separate. So here's what he separates. First day, God separates the day and the night. He takes, he takes, uh, he takes, uh, Day, night, separates, okay? Then he says what? He says, uh, that's good, so let's do more. Day two is the water and the sky. Day three is the water from the land. So he spends the first half, the first three days, not putting in, not adding in. He spends it separating stuff, separating one thing to another. So what would happen, what would happen in your life if you started separating if you start, well, okay, married people, that's not what I meant, okay? Okay, um, I, I understand how that sounds. Some of you are like, mm, that's, that's, okay. <laughs> don't, don't point. It's not nice. <laughs> 
So what would happen if you started separating out your life in a way that said, not, I, don't, I don't want to just have a bunch of junk. I don't want to have a bunch of chaos. I want to have something that is shalom, that's complete, that's complex, yet it works together. So what if, what if you started saying no to average stuff so that you could have room to say yes for better stuff? What if, what if to make yourself happier, you don't need more things? Maybe you need less of them. Maybe a yard sale would make you happier than a new thing. What if? So we see God's example here is that he doesn't start by putting things in. He starts by bringing awareness to the whole thing, looking at the chaos, and then separating those parts. In fact, I find that people have these answers. One of, one of my most common co- coaching questions that I ask people, when they ask me a direct question, they say, what should I, here's my problem, what should I do? My most common question back to them is simply this. What do you think a wise person would do if they found themselves in a similar situation? A hundred percent of the time, they already have an answer. And what I find is, is we don't need answers as much as we need space. I am, I am really guilty of this because I like to be busy. I like to have a lot of stuff going on. Um, and, and, and sometimes I can get to a place even where I feel like I'm not giving out of abundance anymore. I'm giving out of lack. Like, I'm not giving something that I have to give. I'm giving my, like, my arm. I'm giving, thing, like, I'm giving my leg. I'm giving things that I can't replace to people, and I'm depleting myself to the point of misery. And I just don't think that's what we were created to be. I don't think that's what we were created to do. I wonder, when was the last time, I mean, really think about this, when was the last time that you were actually free during your free time? When was the last time? Like, what if, and and I I have this guilt too, right? I've got a a six-year-old, and she wants to play with daddy, right? Like, she wants to play all the time, and there's nothing more fun than playing with her if I'm present, like if I'm actually there playing with her. How many times have you, if you have kids, how many times have you been playing with your kid or been with your kid, but you weren't there? And I find that when that happens for me, it's usually because I keep putting stuff in. I keep creating new stuff, and I'm not separating, and I'm not taking out. I'm not separating, and I'm not taking out. So those first three days, first three days, God essentially creates a template. So you might think about your calendar in this way, right? So how can you, how can you separate out your, your, your things, your calendar in a way to go, not, not, not so you don't have any responsibilities, but how can you empty it as much as possible so that then we can do what God actually does next, which is add in the things that are valuable, add in the things that actually matter, like that we actually want, that are actually good, like, what, what if? So the first three days, God separates stuff. The next three days, what does he add? Day four, he adds the sun, the moon, the stars. Day five, the fish, all the sea creatures. Day six, animals and humans. And then something interesting happens. At the end of day six, everything's created. Everything's done. Verse 31, it says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Now, he uses the word good seven times through this creation story. Light is good. Separating day one is good. Separating day two is good. Separating in day three is good. Day four, animals. Day five, more stuff. Day six, humans. More stuff. Good, good, good. He says good seven times. The last time he says good, he puts an extra word in there. He says it's very good. It's very good. Not just regular good. Not just regular good. He says that it's very good. And I thought, like, we throw words around a lot. Like, I say I love my wife, but I also also say that I love queso, right? So, like, so, so sometimes in the English language, like, one word can have multiple meanings. So, like, for God to be like, that was good, that was good, that was good. It doesn't seem like, like the right, like, if you've just created everything, I wouldn't think that you go, mm, that's very good, right? So I look back and I, say, I said, okay, so, so what are the words that, he's, that, that are actually being used? Like, what's the translation? What's the Hebrew word? So here's, there's, there's two words. The first word, the first word 
is tov. The second word is meu, which means valuable, abundantly. So what God is saying is that the light is valuable, separating, valuable, adding back the good things only is valuable. And then when you put it all together, this complex thing, it's very good. Here's another example. Yesterday, it was rainy. I was in my house. That's good. Had a roof over my head. Good. My daughter wanted to watch a movie. We sat down on our comfy sectional. Good. We turned on Netflix. Good. Okay? We watched this movie with her under my arm for about an hour and a half. And all I could think about is this is very good. The house by itself, it's good. Netflix is good. Even having a kid, that's, that's good. But when you have those moments of, of peace, and when you have that, those moments of shalom, those are very... Here's another example. Here's another example. Uh, cheese. Queso is my love language. Cheese <laughs> is, is good. Right? Chicken is good. Uh, tortillas are good. Quesadillas are very good. Tov mayu. <laughs> by themselves, the parts by themselves are good. So what happens, what happens if God doesn't create space? What if God just takes the first thing and just throws everything together? What happens? Chaos stays. But we have to take the time in our lives to go, okay, let's put some awareness to this. Let's put some plan around this. Where are the areas that are not helping me create shalom in my life? What are the areas that are pulling down or taking away shalom? And then God does something else really interesting on the seventh day. God rests. Now, did God get tired? Was God just worn out watching Adam struggle with naming all the animals? No, he wasn't worn out. Of course not. Maybe he was trying to tell us something, though. So instead of just trying to tell us what to do, he shows us. He shows us. Because a great creator, and here's, here's the thing that I get more than anything, this is, this is, this is, convicted me more than anything, is what a great creator does, a person who has innate creativity, like you, a person who has innate greatness, like you, here's what they do. They know when to start creating, and they know when to stop. Think about the statue of David. When Michelangelo was chiseling the statue, there came a point where it was done, where it was shalom, where it was complete, where it was whole, and one more, one more hit against the chisel would have turned it back into just simply a piece of marble. So I think this star points us somewhere. I think it points us somewhere. So the question is, where does this star point us? So this star points us to Jesus. And you might wonder, like, okay, so how does, that, how does, how does the star point us to Jesus? Because Jesus points us to Shalom. That's why Isaiah called Jesus the Prince of Shalom. That's why Paul referred to Jesus as Jesus is our Shalom. Jesus is our Prince of Peace. Jesus is our peace. And what Jesus says, which is really interesting, is maybe as interesting as what he doesn't say. So let's talk about for just a second what Jesus doesn't say. Do you know in the New Testament, nowhere does it show up where Jesus says, worship me? Jesus never said it. As I'm reading and studying for this, it never, like I'm looking for it, and it never shows up anywhere in the Bible. Find it. It's not in there. The second thing he never says is he never says, accept me into your heart. He never says that. There's actually nothing in the New Testament about the sinner's prayer. It doesn't show up. You know what Jesus says over and over? Follow. In fact, in John, Jesus says, if you hold on to my teachings, you are my disciples then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What they're talking about there, 
they're talking about an experiential knowing, meaning as we create, as we separate, as we take out, as we add in, as we rest, then rinse and repeat, we will know if we taste and see. So perhaps the only way for us to get to a place of shalom in our life is to take the not just believing intellectually, but believing by following the teachings of Jesus, the teachings of peace, the teachings of kindness, the teachings that Jesus shows us. So here's the punchline. If you want to follow the way of Christ, if you want to follow the way of Christ, that perhaps is the only way to create a life that you don't need a vacation from.